Hey, everybody, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes as you trickle in. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have a survey that some of you have taken, and we need the rest of you to take while we're waiting to get started. Um, the link to that is dropped in the chat right now. So while we're waiting for everybody, follow that and please fill out the survey for the second part of today's demos. Okay, looks like we've got a good amount of you to start. So um, welcome to day two of Rising Symposium for Climate and Equity presented by Woodworks. Um, we'd also like to thank our other couple of sponsors, Nano Architecture and Interiors and Huseman and Associates Consulting Engineers as we go into day two, um, as well as our break sponsors who we'll see more from during our break. Um, day two is all about tools and collaboration. So for those of you who are joining us only today and weren't here for day one, um, Rising Symposium for Climate and Equity is a four-part series um, throughout the month of November, all about all things climate, the Architecture 2030 Challenge, and um, how climate does and does not affect us all equally. Um, day two is all about the tools you need to elevate your practice, and today we're joined um, by a great panel uh, ranging from architects to consultants. Um, and professionals in the field on who we need to collaborate with and what architect scope is. Um, so first will be Liz McCormick um, joining us virtually from UNC Charlotte. Liz's research strives to enhance architectural innovation and construction technologies in tropical regions. She's an architect and today we'll be speaking on what exactly it is in architect scope to combat climate. She's currently assistant professor of architecture and building technology at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. There, she's also part of the integrated design research lab. Following Liz, we have Lori Flick here in New Orleans from Synergy Consulting Engineers. Lori has several years of experience in the design of mechanical systems, energy analysis for new and existing buildings, sustainable consulting, lead documentation, and commissioning. She has led nearly 100 lead charrettes educating teams on the relevant criteria and offering insight to the industry's best practices and evolving technology. Her project experience involves design projects spanning numerous industry sectors from $3 million to $400 million. Jackie Dadakis is joining us from Green Coast Enterprises, and she'll be speaking about why we need to measure our buildings and our building performance. Um, she's the managing director of Green, Co Green Coast Enterprise Services, the division of, of that uh, sector that provides strategic consulting services to property owners, municipalities, and utilities seeking to be more energy efficient. Before joining Green Coast, Jackie worked for Clean Energy Solutions as a senior consultant and also worked for Rebuilding Together, a national nonprofit with affiliates of, in over 200 communities in the U.S. providing free home repair to low-income home owners. As an AmeriCorps Vista, she launched Rebuilding Together's response to Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast. We're also joined again by Walid al Gandhi today. Um, he's a mentor for the sessions uh, that joined, uh, joined us on day one and will be presenting today on um, energy efficient design. Walid joins us from SPD Dumas Ripple as the firm's sustainability enabler, bringing key, key experience from his time in energy modeling sector at Carbon Consulting. His interests in architecture lie in the technical realm as well as the cultural. To this end, he challenges our design teams to marry the development of high performance, energy efficient buildings in consideration of vernacular architecture and the art of different cultures. Liz Shepard is here with us today from Life City, New Orleans, and she's the CEO of Life City and has created the company to help build a more equitable and sustainable community all over New Orleans. And she's now bringing the tools to communities and developers all over the country. In 2017, Life City won the SBA's Statewide Sustainable Business Champion Award, and Liz was recognized as one of the top 50 business women of the year in 2015 in New Orleans. 
Trained as both a facilitator and a lean green associate, Liz and her company help businesses maximize both social and environmental impact for growing profits. And then today to wrap things up, after the tool demonstrations, we have Kathleen Gordon joining us from AIA Louisiana. Kathleen Gordon, Executive Director of AIA Louisiana, coordinates with a number of groups focused on education as well as long-term resiliency planning. She works closely with regulatory agencies affecting architecture, advocates for the profession within the Louisiana legislature, and strives diligently to identify areas where architects can best utilize their talents to the benefit of their communities, state, and future generations. She is also the recipient of a 2016 AIA Louisiana Presidential Medal for her leadership and guidance in the aftermath of the 2016 flooding. Um, so right before we get sort of started, just want to remind you all, follow the link in the chat, take that survey so we can place you in the tool demonstrations. And without further ado, remind you that um, this session is being recorded for future viewing. And Liz, go ahead and take it away. Hi, my name is Liz McCormick, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. A few years ago, I was a research fellow at SQ Dumas Ripple, and I'm really excited to be back in New Orleans today, albeit virtually. So thank you for having me. Um, my brief talk today addresses the architect's scope in reducing energy and carbon consumption in the built environment. So we'll talk about site versus sort energy, promise carbon, passive strategies, people and money, and ultimately the architect's job. Now, I know that most of the people at this event understand this difference, but I think it's really important to clarify in order to define our role as architects in the energy cycle. Site energy is energy measured at the site, which is shown by a building's utility meter and listed on the utility bills. So usually when we're talking about a net zero building, we're talking about site energy. We really have full control over the amount of energy we use on site. However, we don't have much control over how the energy is produced and how it gets to us. Everyone should buy electric cars, right? We'll reduce our site energy to, to zero, no more gasoline, that's great. Um, but when we're using uh, coal to produce all of that electricity that we use to charge our vehicle, we're likely doing more harm than we are good. So what we really need to think about is our source energy, which is called our primary energy. It's energy measured at the source and accounts for all additional energy and energy losses required to deliver energy to a site. So it's the energy used in our building, plus the energy used to get that energy to our site and the energy used to make all that energy. Scientists say that global carbon emissions need to be cut in half by 2030 in order to have a 50% chance of staying under 1.5 degree uh, temperature rise. But we've already committed enough carbon through existing power plants, our cars that are already on the road, and oops, sorry, and other things. Um, we've, we've already exceeded this quota. That's the idea of promised carbon. It's too late for energy efficiency in buildings. We need to be striving for net zero energy and net zero carbon with every building we design. This is hard. Don't get me wrong, we need to celebrate every step in this direction, but as a profession, we need to be pushing ourselves more. This begins in architecture school, in the design studio, and continues through advocacy groups like AIA. So I'm really happy to see this event happening today in New Orleans. I love this definition of sustainability because it's not about saving the planet. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It's about people and preserving the viability of future generations. I took this photo when Greta Thunberg came to Charlotte for a climate action march last year and saw this little boy holding the sign and thought, yes, that's why we're doing this. It's not for me. We're doing it for him. The number one impact an architect can have on the final energy consumption of the building is a consideration of passive strategies. Passive design cannot be effectively integrated as an afterthought. It must inform the very shape of the building. One of the primary challenges to the application of passive design strategies revolves around the fact that free energy available to the climate is highly dynamic. So understanding this dynamic nature of the climate is key to designing passive strategies. Thinking, uh, think of passive strategies uh, as both minimizing the negative impacts of the climate while taking advantage of this free energy. A common instinct is to rely on engineers to optimize the systems. And this is a great strategy on top of considered approach to climate and site. 
So you implement your passive or bioclimatic design strategies, design a good envelope, optimize your energy efficient building system, and then you add renewable energy systems like wind or solar. That stuff isn't free financially or environmentally. It has a huge carbon footprint. So you want to get your loads down as low as possible so that you only have to buy a little bit to get to net zero. In architecture, we love to start with an apology. We love to spend our clients' money, but we need to stop playing defense and recognize the value of our decisions, particularly when they have a significant impact on the human experience. 70% of the company's budget goes to people. Salaries are the highest expense in any environment. When an employee comes to work and is more present in their workspace, the company makes more money. It's really as simple as that. So you've probably heard of this concept before, the triple bottom line approach, which focuses on life cycle justification, so economic, environmental, and human, for building decision makers to overcome first least cost decision making patterns that prevent investments in high performance, energy efficient buildings. The research is focused on the identification of economic, uh, environmental, and human benefits of energy efficient technologies and systems for customizable cost benefit calculations, including simple payback and net present value. So let's look at an example. Let's look at awnings for shade, a developer's favorite thing to cut. Here you can see uh, the first cost is $330 per employee, which gets you to a eight year payback period. That's pretty substantial for a single part of the building when you look at it entirely at first cost. So let's, let's add on the environmental considerations. Assuming there was some kind of carbon tax or quantification of environmental considerations, we're looking at a six and a half year payback, down from eight, which is not a huge savings, but it is, it's something. But now let's look at our human capital. These shades have a huge impact on glare and solar heat gain, which directly affect human comfort and ultimately their performance as employees. Or if you look at it in a school setting, research shows that it has direct impacts on students' learning capabilities and leads to higher test scores. By factoring that in, you're down to a two-year payback window, which is quite substantial. This example really demonstrates that it's not just about the first cost, but the entire life cycle, including the, the people that use the building. Because ultimately, buildings don't use energy, people do. So what's our job as architects? Keep it simple. Buildings that rely on the basic principles of physics are more likely to succeed than those that depend entirely on advanced high-tech solutions. Systems will fail at times, but the laws of thermodynamics will not change. We need to design more in sync with the environment uh, and the rhythms that it has in order to get to zero. We can't just rely on the engineers. We all have a role to play. And thank you very much for having me. I think that's a great segue into my portion. Hi, I'm Lori Fleck, partner at Synergy Consulting Engineers. Um, we're going to talk about today, maybe, there we go. Which building systems use the most energy? Um, we know that buildings consume 40% of the overall energy in the US of everything combined in the industry, transportation, buildings make up 40% of that. 40% of that is HVAC. The majority of that load is based off of envelope and infiltration. Obviously people, lights, plug loads, all that plays, plays a role in our HVAC design, but ultimately the bulk of that comes from the facade. There's lighting, water heating, plug loads, elevator, and everything else. So I, I think the task here and what we talked about was what's the engineer's take? And my challenge to you is how can we make better buildings? And I'm requesting that you challenge um, engineers, not just challenge yourselves, but really challenge the people that you're working with. And we're gonna do that by talking about integrated design, discuss first cost and operating costs, and then also just require design engineers to design to a higher standard. Um, saying something is designed to code is not gonna cut it in the state of Louisiana where we have a code that's over 12 years old. So we really want to elevate buildings here in the city and the state. And I think the best way to do that is for us to come together to decide 
um, what's the best way to do that? So the first challenge is collaboration, integrated design. Um, you know, integrated design works best if we get together early and often to talk about what goals we want to set and how we want to meet them. Um, if you come late in the game and say, let's let's do heat recovery, let's switch systems from a DX to a chilled water system, of course the cost is going to go up exponentially. But if we start the conversation day one and say, I want to save 20% on our energy, or what's the focus from the owner? What does the owner want to do? How can we achieve that? We can achieve those goals pretty simply just by having the conversation early on. Um, doing early block loads for energy modeling to talk about massing and fenestration, helping you, the architect, to decide which facade system works best in terms of HVA sizing. And that way you can immediately cut off or shed a few tons of air conditioning just based on um, that information alone. That information is powerful. Um, as a basic design principle, we need buy-in from the owner, the engineer, and the contractor for critical for success. Just having um, you, the architect, say, this is what we want to do. We can't get there unless everyone is on board from day one. Um, we need to write it down and make people accountable. We talk about things in meetings and then, you know, months go you know, down the road and we say, well, we switch from that because we wanted to VE this or that, but having something documented or written, you know, you want to call it an owner's project requirements or some living document um, that we can shoot from, I think makes everyone accountable as we go through the project. So there's no oops later on. Um, and then again, just using those simple energy models uh, to guide that massing and fenestration decisions can help us make other decisions later on as it relates to HV's equipment and also more complex energy modeling strategies. Um, this is a big one for me. The next challenge is to change the narrative, first cost versus operating cost. We know the, the, the standard scenario, and I'm gonna use daylighting as an example. Um, the architect and the engineer uh, create this, these design documents. We're including daylighting because we have a lot of fenestration, a lot of top lighting, a lot of side lighting. And we provide the system because it, it makes sense. It's gonna save energy. We submit the, the drawings for bid. They come back and say, well, you know, that, that system, the lighting system is $150,000. If we cut out daylighting, we'll save 30,000. And usually that's where the conversation stops. And what we need to do is change the conversation and say, well, what's the incremental cost? So we say, we save $40,000 for this first cost, but what does that do for the operation or the life of the building? And the bottom here on the screen, I show, this is um, taken from a project that I worked on at the Columbia Business School um, a few years ago. And these are the different measures that they call, they're basically energy efficient measures and they received incentive and we had effectively just done a uh, simple payback for each of these measures. So this is a great example. This is daylighting controls. We're looking at an annual savings of 44,000 kilowatt hours, um, an annual electric savings of $10,000. We're talk talking about a total of maybe 9,000 and overall electric savings per year with an incremental cost of about $40,000. So overall, we get a simple payback of four years. So after four years, that technology that we paid up for is paid off. But what we don't seem to convey or understand or really hit home is that that savings goes throughout the life of the building. So that savings of ten dollars or $9,000 goes on for another 30 years. It's a continued savings that's seen for the building. So over the life of the building, we're talking about millions of dollars in operating costs um, that's saved just by having this one conversation instead of stopping the conversation as, well, let's be this item. Okay, so let's move on. We need to have the energy model data or at least some form of conversation piece to bring to owners to have this conversation. Um, you know, some owners, uh, you know, if it's not an institution or a hotel or an owner occupied building, I think having this conversation is tough, especially if they're looking to just sell the property and they're not really worried about it. But for um, people who are looking to stay in the building for a number of years, money talks. And this is one that certainly should not be ignored. Um, the next challenge is to challenge me, challenge engineers. Um, expect more just in terms of, um, of building performance, of having that knowledge. Um, you know, request block models for systems uh, analysis and fees. Most engineers use energy modeling software or some form of software already to do loads. 
in order to add on a few parameters to do an energy analysis is very simple. It is not free, but it is certainly not the same cost as going and doing a full-blown energy model with a separate, separate provider. I implore you to talk to your engineers to see what services they offer um, as it relates to loads, because this information is critical. Um, include testing requirements in the specs. Um, I think it's important that we mandate contractors to also be accountable. It is not enough for us to design a system. The contractor has to install the system. It has to work. It has to work for the design. Um, if, if there's no requirements mandating that they, that they do system startup other than the startup, um, we're, we're really losing a, a benefit there in the building starting day one, not operating the way it's supposed to. Um, I've, I've been part of ASHRAE since 2006. Um, we're currently in Louisiana using 90.1-2007. There's a study that was done recently for 90.1-2016 to show the savings of energy going from 07 to 16. Um, and you're looking at about a 30% energy energy savings comparing the two and given energy rates across the country, it's probably gonna be 15 to 22% energy cost savings just for designing to a higher standard. Now, the thing is, is that 90.1 and ASHRAE as an organization is made up of engineers like me, research scientists, manufacturers, vendors, technicians. Um, when they produce these standards, they're not producing it in hopes that the market will be ready for it. The market is already prepared. Equipment manufacturers, controls manufacturers have all of these components, all of these efficient equipment efficiencies already on the shelf. This is a state of the shelf standard. They're not asking you to do anything above and beyond what manufacturers are already providing. So don't uh, believe when uh, either contractors or other engineers say, you know, it's going to be too expensive. It's it's already there and we are a state that is far behind in the energy um, code world. So, you know, that's not a valid excuse. Um, and then the last is don't skimp on the CA. You know, uh, we need to be on site. We need to see um, what's happening on site. If it's being installed per, per the engineer's design, um, please encourage owners uh, not to, you know, save money and skimp out on the CA. Uh, we need that service in order to ensure that we are providing you and that the contractor is providing the owner with the building that he paid for. So I appreciate your time. Um, and next up is Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And thank you for the shout out on building codes. This is a, a topic. Lori and I share a passion for in this state. Um, let me get to it. my screen here. Launch. There we go. Uh, I'm Jackie Daticus with Green Coast Enterprises, and I'm going to talk now about once a building is placed in service. Uh, I'm sure many of us have dealt with this before. You may have designed it with all intents and purposes for it to be very energy efficient, very green, designed to lead protocols, and it doesn't operate that way. Um, so this is some data actually that we collected for the Recovery School District in 2016, in which we benchmarked uh, the buildings that are in their portfolio. It's now uh, the New Orleans Public Schools. And the, the bright orange buildings that you see here were buildings that were designed to be LEED certified. Uh, post Katrina, there were a series of schools that were rebuilt with FEMA money. And um, the best of intent was made for these buildings to be super green and efficient. And then when we came back to look at it, um, while some were in fact green and efficient, some were not. And in fact, the two worst performing on an EUI basis were some of the newer schools. Uh, and I know this is a story we all hear time and again, and it's super frustrating, but our buildings are only as good as they are operating in that current moment and making sure that the systems are programmed properly, that the, the property management and facility management team knows how to use the buildings, that someone is regularly checking in on the buildings, particularly on building automation systems and HVAC systems, is really going to long-term drive whether or not these buildings are 
energy efficient. Um, and this sort of just uh, gives the same story that when we went and got the Energy Star score, our worst performing over here at the end were also buildings that should have been doing much better. Um, we've also been working with the city of New Orleans for about five years now. The city of New Orleans did not commit to rebuilding their buildings um, to a LEED standard, which was unfortunate in my opinion uh, for many reasons, but most unfortunate because there was no commissioning requirement out the other side. And so again, some pretty great buildings were actually built and designed, but then no one made sure that they were programmed properly and then they've sort of been operating with no real uh, pattern, um, no real ability to see seasonality. Um, this, the orange, uh, these are the two police stations that were um, basically brand new um, and never actually had any programming done, no schedules set within their systems. Uh, so we actually did a project with the city specifically on the fifth district in which we put in some very basic schedules. This is all we did is to, you know, and, and it's not even for a very long time. You can see it was just shut down some systems between 10 a.m., 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Um, and uh, in a couple cases, bring it down to five days a week instead of seven days a week. Um, our police stations are actually 24 hours. Uh, they are, you know, open to the public. But what we learned is a good chunk of the buildings um, weren't being used, the, that you have uh, your shift come in typically at you know, around 6 a.m. and then your shift come in around 3 p.m. and a shift come in around 11 p.m. But the rest of the time, uh, you'd have plenty of open empty spaces. So they agreed to let us put in these schedules and almost immediately <laughs> you saw this massive um, on a per, this is a, a per square footage drop in their energy usage. So again, this is still the fifth district that doesn't have any form of schedules. Then all of a sudden it drops Seventh district is still just, you know, operating as it was. And it, it led to significant energy savings for the city. And so they're now trying to go through each of their buildings and um, do this exact same thing, set some basic schedules, program the BAS so systems aren't fighting with each other, that there is a, a bit of a, a gap between when heating and cooling turn on. And overall, it's actually leading to pretty substantial savings on the city utility bill. Um, I raise this because it, it's just important that we're constantly putting eyes on our systems and our buildings. So Wilson Charter School was, uh, it was a quick start school after Katrina. So it didn't actually go for a LEED certification, but did have a really advanced building automation system put in. Uh, when we started working with them around here in 2013, 2014, we realized that at some point the, the computer program that ran the building automation system um, was supposed to get an update. It didn't get updated and thus it stopped working and all, all the programming that had been in put, put in place had disappeared. So we worked with the school administration to get it reprogrammed and we were able to hear, um, I believe, we're looking at um, some KVTU data. Sorry, I don't have my axes labeled. And this is probably the orange would be um, electricity and the green would be gas. So you saw um, particularly the gas usage come down substantially in this period of time when we were able to reprogram it and the peaks became lower for the electric usage. But then guess what happened in 2016? The exact same thing. The program got overwritten again, they lost their schedules, and then all of a sudden no one was paying that much attention. Um, I will note it's um, kind of a story of the charter schools in New Orleans that you had charter operators change at this period in time. So the people that we had worked with and, and sort of trained on this no longer were operating the building. A new operator came in um, and we're now working with them to get this reprogrammed and back on schedule, but you know, that was, a year and a half of pretty substantial energy bills for this one particular building. Uh, so commissioning a building is not enough. It's a continuous process, right? Continuous commissioning is becoming a much more common term we're all talking about. And I'm excited to say that retro commissioning is becoming something that in the city of New Orleans, we now specifically have a program that's available 
through uh, our energy efficiency program, Energy Smart. And uh, it's available both with an incentive for uh, anyone on this call who might be an engineer, actually for the report, there's an incentive out there for you to go in and do the study to figure out what needs to be done. And then there's an incentive that's paid out to the uh, contractor, the BAS programming contractor that will be doing the work. Um, and then there's a verification incentive. So it's actually a really rich program because when looking at where we can really gain energy efficiency savings right now in the city of New Orleans in our commercial buildings, it is through retro commissioning all of them. Uh, so currently it is available to buildings over 100,000 square feet and uh, with a, a pretty high electric intensity. Um, I did share a flyer um, for the retro commissioning program that can be passed around later. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, it's very easy to become a, a technical assistance provider through the program. You just get in touch with the Energy Smart administrators, and then you can start bringing your clients to the program as well, and hopefully getting their buildings to perform the way that they were supposed to when you first designed them. Um, so with that, that's my contact information and uh, I can turn it back over. Hey, Jackie, thank you for all that very useful information. I think it's uh, it's me, I'm up and uh, this is Waleed al Gamdi, and I am going to present a case study um, of a building we, we designed here uh, in New Orleans, or over there in New Orleans, I should say. This is the St. Bernard uh, project, um, uh, Toulouse House. It's a, it's a, a multifamily residential um, house in, uh, or building rather, uh, in New Orleans, uh, close to uh, the French Quarter. Um, it's about uh, 45,000 square feet, three floors. Um, and has about uh, 50 apartments, one bedroom and two bedroom. Um, in addition to that, it has some amenities. It has uh, like a, a community room. It has uh, um, a wellness room or like sort of a yoga studio, so to speak. Um, so uh, that's um, uh, that's the background of the project. And the reason we're I'm presenting this is that this is a net zero uh, project. Uh, very, very energy efficient uh, in, in New Orleans. So this is a case study that anyone who's doing multifamily or, or even single family can, can benefit from and see just how practical this is uh, here and down. Um, so that's a, just a general picture. Um, so that's location uh, of it. I think that's off Claiborne, I want to say. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, very close to the Broad Theater. Um, and uh, that's just the massing you see. It's it's uh, uh, not something very complex. Um, it was very it was very much driven by um, by cost, uh, uh, either the fenestration or the material selection or uh, the massing. Um, and it's very uh, very uh, much uh, built on a budget. So generally, we started off by seeing uh, this is the energy sort of design process, if you will. Uh, we started off with what is practical, what's the EUI practical uh, for a building like this. The EUI is energy use intensity, and it's measured in units of energy divided by the square foot area of the of the uh, uh, project over an entire year. Uh, and so we we through some reading, we figured that 15 uh, EUI 15 was possible, um, though we probably when we did some, some studies in our particular climate zone, and 15 is probably more of a national average, we realized that 17 is more of a, a, a like a, a reasonable goal that like, you know, killing uh, the budget. Um, just for comparison, the regional average is 48, and an Energy Star building is 32. So 17 is cutting even the Energy Star by half. Um, so on one side, we decided, or we, we looked into how practical, how practically we can get uh, the EUI to. And then on the other side, we have a very limited roof space. Um, and uh, giving that, giving what's available on the market uh, in terms of re renewable energy and solar panels, um, what's the maximum EUI we can support for a building. And that's where that 19 on the right uh, hand side of, of the screen that you see. So we can develop, or we can, we can generate about 255 
thousand kilowatt hours annually, or, the, or just about 19 uh, EUI. And so the question here is, um, how can we uh, get to that 19 um, in the cheapest way possible? So we know that it's possible, but there are expensive ways to do it and there are cheap ways to do it. And it all depends on where you put your attention. And that's the whole gist of this, this whole case study. Uh, what you see on the screen here uh, on the far left side of the building uh, of the screen is, is the baseline, that, that big box in, in gray. And the EUI was 59. Um, and so this is a building built to code. Um, and then uh, and each, each of these bars represent a, a building system. So, so envelope lighting, HVAC, domestic hot water, and appliances. And you can see that there's no silver bullet. There's no magic uh, um, sort of uh, measure or design um, uh, strategy that you can implement. It's rather incremental and every single uh, um, system has something to add to the energy design of the building. This is broken up a little bit further. And so when you look at those orange um, uh, bars, you can see that there's roof uh, insulation increase. There's a wall insulation increase. Uh, um, the window to ratio is different. Infiltration is reduced. With lighting, you have LPD reductions. You have lighting controls and so on and so forth. And so uh, this is a very um, uh, typical approach to how you uh, design a building from an energy standpoint. That's just a picture of the solar panels on the roof of, of the building. Um, this is just to give you an idea of how appliances is a big deal on a multifamily project. Uh, uh, the, the whole gist here is to show you that um, clothes dryers and refrigerators consume about 35% each. And so that you should focus on those two. And this is also another way to sell, for example, clothes dryers, you see the reduction could be, it's possible to reduce your energy by 75% almost. Um, so um, uh, that is uh, what you can do. Uh, the, the, the sort of the, the three learning uh, or the three important lessons we learned from, from this uh, case study was that air tightness is a big deal. Uh, heat pump water heaters were a big deal especially multifamily, and then very ultra efficient um, appliances. Uh, just to cap this off, we built this uh, for about $164 uh, per square foot, and that's about 22% below average. Uh, the average is about 210 square, uh, square feet, and this is the regional average. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey. Um, Kelsey, or is it Liz? I'm here. <laughs> hey, can you see my screen, everybody? Looks good, Liz. Okay, great. So Kelsey said we have some great questions, so I'll try to be as quick as I can. It says sharing is paused. Here, I'll, I'll uh, Looks like because I think I shared and you shared as well, Kelsey. Yep, I'm turning mine off. Cool. Sounds. Uh -oh. It should be good now. Mine's off. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Um, let's see. So thanks so much for being with us today. Um, this is such a great topic and I really appreciate all the speakers so far. Um, so my name is Liz Shepard and I am, am uh, the CEO of Life City and we're an impact management company. And I thought it was pretty interesting when I checked out the AIA uh, website and spoke about the history of, of its formation back in 1909. And of course, it was a group, a club of, of active men, but it also had a very clear statement of, of purpose, which that when it becomes a part of a great national body of men who stand for all that is highest and best, not only for themselves, but for those whom they serve and those whose service they require in their practice. So the reason I bring this up is one, I know we've had a big conversation about equity in the space. And uh, I know there are a lot of great efforts to try to increase you know, women and people of color in the architecture field. Um, but if we are truly building buildings for everyone and for their highest and best use, um, how do we think holistically about this work? And uh, the main message I'd like to give you all today is, is leadership. 
that when you do integrative design, it's not, it takes more time, it takes more collaboration. Um, it's got a longer time period for return to consider. Um, and it's, it's, it's harder, but it requires leadership. And when we do it, we do get the benefits of having buildings that are operating more affordably with tenants that are more comfortable with um, impacts that are helping our communities become more resilient in fighting things like climate change and equity. So my main point to you today is no matter who you are, whether you're an engineer, an architecture company, whatever you do, you have an opportunity to step up and to lead and to uh, make this integrative design and this integrative collaborative approach a priority. And um, I just wanna commend you for being here, for taking the time to learn, and for uh, the, the effort that it takes, I know, to, to go above and beyond. Um, today, I'm just gonna quickly talk about Life City, how we measure impact and some tools that we can share. Um, our mission is to build an economy that works for good city by city. Um, and that means that the result of business activities improve our environment, support equity, and empower people in being their, their best selves. Um, we help organizations define impact and development projects as well. Uh, we help develop what we call an impact management system, so a way for you and your organization to monitor your impact, and then a way to validate it um, for, as a third party and to market it to your community. And some things that we really built our, our design, designs and tools around are, are a, few, a few values. One is that impact truly changes on where you stand. And I think we know that through, through lead buildings, where a lead building that's built in Arizona and a lead building that's built in New Orleans is going to have to consider very different geographies. So we have to really define impact locally. Um, it's, uh, impact is a part of an interconnected system and must be thought of holistically. Uh, again, I already mentioned today already of integrated design. We couldn't be uh, more, uh, more supportive of that. And then impact is already happening. Everything you do, right, is having an impact. Everything your organization does, your projects, everything. And so how do you take the time to really be intentional to maximize that impact. Um, and then, of course, impact is dynamic. And as Jackie pointed out, you build a building, but people are now operating it. How do you um, assess that and, and continually um, uh, reflect and improve that energy management of the building? Liz, this is yeah. I think the screen is black. Um, can you share and unshare or something? OK. Oh. You guys can't see my slides? No. Now again, uh oh. We'll huh. make sure it's available to you afterward. I, I know I'm. <laughs> Let's go through like this. So you you missed the you you missed the ten six ten stoppers, but other than that, you didn't miss much. Um, okay, so y'all can see my screen now, huh? Can you still hear see my screen? Nope. No. No. Okay. It's so good. That's it. We, we see it now. Awesome. Awesome. Gotta be have we were doing too good. And I gotta have at least one technical problem with these things. Okay. So um are we, are we still good? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. All right. So when we in terms of how we measure impact, so we identify, depending on our client, we identify, of course, you know, international standards, UN goals, but we also identify, you know, sector specific standards, and then of course, community based standards. And, and of course, uh, you know, our clients also develop some of their own um, contributions to, to indicators of impact that we consider as well. Um, we typically use social environmental economic categories to which are pretty standard. And then for developers and investors, we uh, this is one example of an impact management system where we look comprehensively at the process of uh, and making an investment uh, development into perhaps like a new markets investment for a development project. How do we help uh, them identify impactful leads um, and uh, evaluate those deals, optimize the impact of those deals through business, through the building management and things like that. Um, and uh, create formal agreements for impact and then again, report it and market it. So, um, you know, the sourcing impactful leads, that's obviously building up your network in this case, but we also um, help create score, uh, rubrics and scorecards. So um, if you're considering different opportunities for investments or for development, you might wanna consider, okay, what kind of developments does your company wanna really do and create a scorecard to evaluate the deals that you participate in. Um, and then we, really firmly believe, and I think this has been echoed already, that when you're developing a project, you wanna engage the community. So 
Um, we help create community advisory boards and, and focus groups for things like new markets tax credits that are really designed to support low income community members, low income persons. Uh, we, uh, we help really interview those, uh, those, um, those individuals um, and then also help support the, the business that's going to be operating in the development, to maintain those impacts that have been uh, assessed and supported through the investment. Um, we help separate right community benefit agreements for these investments um, as well. And of course, we produced um, third party impact validation marketing videos and reports that help market the, the impact of these investments. Um, so that's what we do. And three tools I wanted to highlight quickly um, is, let me see here. So, um, one is, you know, just uh, we have an, an organizational assessment. So here in New Orleans, because impact must be measured locally, we have the Regional Sustainability Committee. They've identified 10 impact areas that really matter to New Orleans. Um, and we have a scorecard that every, any company can assess themselves, set goals, and then potentially also get recognized um, at our annual Lever City Awards. So we have a, a company assessment. So any one of your organizations could take this assessment to maximize your impact on the community. We also have uh, a project assessment that we've developed with Concordia, where basically if you're considering a development and you want um, the developer to, to consider some greener architecture or equity pieces in, in, in this development, they, this is a sort of a very high level lead with mixed with equity uh, assessment tool where we, we, we take we provide the form, they, they take out the survey, fill out the survey, then we sit down and talk with them about, okay, well, you, you mentioned no, would you like to, to do some of these things? Here are some of the long-term cost benefits of, of these best practices, et cetera. Um, and then we also do third-party videos and reports. Um, and yeah, we've been really excited to create a ton of impacts around uh, New Orleans and around the US and are, are happy to uh, work with anyone. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Liz. Sorry to have that little overlap there, but that's a great presentation and we're so happy to have, have you joining us. Um, so it looks like everybody was getting to the questions within the chat. Um, so I, I think we're pretty well caught up on, on questions in the chat box. Um, if we're missing anything though, uh, shoot a message in there. We've got a couple minutes probably for one good question that maybe everybody could talk about. Um, as you see right now too in the slides, we just have a couple attendees who haven't um, filled out the form for, uh, for the tool demos coming up. Um, so just while we're transitioning in, just go ahead and do that. Otherwise we'll just place you randomly. Um, and, and otherwise, a, I guess, go ahead. There's a question in the Q&A from Nathan. Oh, somebody actually used the Q&A. Nice, thanks Nathan. Um, there's a, a question. Oh, this is great. So Nathan, we've been talking a lot about energy. The question is, do the panelists have any recommendations on calculating or reducing the carbon footprint of building materials and construction? Um, so that's embodied carbon. And it's important, yep, because a fourth of the building pollution from buildings is due to the materials. Um, so I can speak to that a little bit because I know most of our panelists are energy specific. Um, there's a couple main things. One is that the carbon footprint of buildings um, from an embodied carbon standpoint is 50 to 80% structure. So look at your structure and just like we're saying with energy to optimize with your um, MEP consultants and your energy side engineering, look to your structural engineer to optimize your structure. Um, Concrete comes in kind of heaviest from a carbon standpoint. A great option there is looking at fly ash mixtures and seeing if your construction schedule can target a 56 day cure strength instead of 28. Um, steel, it's good to source from electric arc furnaces for steel. They have a lower carbon footprint um, and are generally kind of just a, a lighter, more uh, nimble structure. And third is building with wood. Um, there's a lot of data on that. And Nathan, I'd be happy to talk with you more. Um, everybody should have my email um, from the session and I'd be happy to cover more on embodied carbon because you're right, it's, it's a really important piece. 
um, once we once we get to net zero, then embodied carbon is all we have to worry about. So, so we've got two problems to tackle. And, and I think it also really um, has to do with a community challenge where when we deconstruct buildings, there's not an easy process to take those materials and recycle them. I mean, we have the green project, but you know, we have, for example, just exhibits that go up in the convention center. Um, a lot of construction companies aren't really, you know, and demolition companies aren't trained in how to demolish. And of course, you know, using a used building is the best, you know, way to go to maintain that the structural integrity of a building you already have. But there's not um, a lot of infrastructure in place for us to find and reuse those those building materials. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for problem solving um, as a community. Um, Kelsey, I'd like to Anybody mention. Else? Yeah, one one quick thing. Um, I think uh, um, Lori mentioned that in in the chat that. Um, uh, typically, uh, uh, contractors and engineers um, uh, address uh, the incentive program applications, um, and uh, I would I would say that uh, for architects, uh, make sure that you ask about them. Um, I think when during the negotiation phase, um, we architects tend to uh, obviously haggle uh, and uh, uh, ask uh, uh, for more and and want to pay less, uh, and so this is one of those things that. Uh, maybe an engineer just feels that it's just more work and that that's not benefiting them and you're not being compensated for that for that they don't take on that service and what essentially you're doing you're really leaving for the for the owner you're leaving money on the table and you're sacrificing some energy efficiency that otherwise you could have just asked the question and, and maybe you can figure it out um, and how that's being paid for is a different question but asking that question is very important is is there are there incentives available, um, whether you're in, in Louisiana or, or in other states, and um, what are they and how much are they going to uh, uh, cover and all that stuff? These questions can be answered very early before any work is being done. And I can I can just add to that. Um, the Energy Smart Program not only has the retro commissioning incentive, but they also have an existing building incentive if you're doing renovations, as well as a new construction incentive. So if you have a building that's a gut, or you're actually building the new construction, they pay you to uh, design and install for a building that's better than code. So we just talked about that 30% 2016 versus 2007. So if you're designing to a higher standard, you, you know the client is automatically eligible for money. So just make sure you have that conversation um, from the start because there are incentives in New Orleans and statewide for that. That's great. Thanks, Lori and Molly for in that. We have to wrap up Q&A. Um, Aaron just dropped in the chat the link to our second session so we can get into breakout rooms for tools. We have uh, about five, 10 minutes um, for everybody to get up, stretch your legs, grab a drink of water beforehand. Um, but right when we end the session, we do ask that you log into the Zoom link um, so that we can get you set up in your breakout rooms so that we can get tool demos going immediately. So we'll see you soon in, um, and looking forward to the tool demos. Thanks all of our panelists for joining us today. It was a great discussion.